Okay, so our next speaker hardly needs any introduction, so I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Anna Clemenston to the podium. We're all going to think up with lots of questions. Um, Anna, as you know, is our palliative care consultant in the Northwest Hospice and a GP, and she's also the chairperson over our Research and Education Foundation. So, thanks, Anna. Thank you very much. So, I'm uh, coming with a different cap on here. As you know, at the beginning of this, um, at the beginning of this conference, we said we were bringing people in to talk about their patient experiences, um, because we wanted to keep the focus of research firmly on the patient, and we gain, think you gain insights into research through talking about um, through being a patient. And so, I'm going to uh, give you an account of um, some of the insights I gained through being a so getting, getting diagnosed and treated for breast cancer at the beginning of COVID. I apologise to a couple of you who may have heard this before because I presented it at Grand Rounds. Um, you can get a coffee if you want, uh, but um, I'll begin. Now, I realise that having been so strict with time, I should be strict myself, so I'm just going to see if I can put in a five-minute timer to remind me because uh, I know my talk has the potential to go over, but wave at me and I'll stop. Um, okay, so when I, when I was, this is, this is, what I want to tell you is that I um, decided to take a, a photo diary of my journey through uh, the breast cancer travels. Um, I'm not sure why I did it. I think it's because I like photos and it seemed logical. But this is actually pre, uh, pre the diagnosis. This is uh, April of uh, 2020 and uh, COVID was coming across our shorelines. We were getting bombarded with emails. We were having to change our health service on a daily basis, and I was knackered. And this is a picture I sent home to my family saying, flipping heck, I'm done in. And it was in this office, and this office uh, takes center stage in a lot of my journey. It was in this office that I was on a Zoom call to uh, my colleagues. We were discussing how we managed the healthcare service in, in view of the changes with COVID. When I bent down uh, to pick up a pen I dropped, and my bra strap fell off my shoulder, I readjusted it and hit a lump. And I continued with my meeting, but I was like in the back of my mind, that's a bit strange. And I got off, off, off the phone and I thought, really? Maybe? No. But um, there is breast cancer in my family, so I couldn't just ignore it. So I went home that evening and um, I set up a, a group for my, my family, a WhatsApp group. We've got bigger WhatsApp groups that include all the in-laws and sometimes the, the nephews and nieces. So I thought that wasn't really appropriate. So I set up a WhatsApp group and um, went to tell my family that I, I had a lump and I was going to get it, it, it looked at. And this really talks to how I approached my journey. And I think it's affected by my um, practice as a palliative care doctor in that I was very open about my diagnosis with my family and once I was diagnosed with my colleagues. And for me, that was a helpful um, strategy. It's not everybody's strategy, but it meant for my family who couldn't come down because there was COVID, um, they knew that they didn't have to worry. They were going to be told everything. And actually, I could talk to them if I was having a bad day. For my colleagues, it meant that they knew where I was at. And also, I had no awkward co uh, conversations when I was at the supermarket or if I bumped into somebody in the hospital. They knew where I was at. And actually, the, the other side to that was I got really, really nice feedback. I got lovely cards. I got lovely gifts. And actually, it was really positive. Um, Granny O'Malley, I think, who's here, she rang me up and said, do you want to go for a walk? It was just so nice. And I think when we've got friends and colleagues who are ill, there's probably very little harm in sending a text and saying, I hope you're doing okay. The, um, I went to my GP. He was fantastic. He was a bit worried that he was a he, but I wasn't worried that it was a he. I liked him. I trusted him. And I was delighted that he was there and he was in my corner throughout the whole disease process. And that made a big difference. And like Deirdre, I think if you've got, got good health professionals behind you, who you trust, it really makes a huge difference. And that's us. And we really need to be thinking about making sure that we're there for our, our patients. Following my GP appointment, I didn't know whether or not there was going to be one-stop clinics. It was in the middle of COVID, but there were. And actually, the HSE had just joined in with the private service. Golly, we're already three minutes through this. The private service. And uh, so I got to go down to a one-spot clinic. It was an interesting, interesting event. I was so thankful to the mammographer. She was willing to come this close to me. They drape you over the mammography machine. And they're like there. And nobody was coming that close to you in COVID. So I was really pleased. But you know that breaking bad news bit? Well, I was lying on my back. I was nude. The lady was um, putting the probe around me. She was hocking in my oxygen. She was really probing there. Just want to see what that lymph node is. Mm -hmm. Mm, no, definitely DCS, definitely cancer, she said, as I lay there on the plinth. You know, maybe not the textbook way to do it. 
as it happened, for me, I found that quite helpful in a way because when I went to see the surgeon, he wasn't taking any rug from under my feet. I knew where I was at and I could put on my game face and I could listen to him. But, you know, when patients come and tell us that they had bad news broken to them badly, I think we tend to think, ah, probably they're exaggerating, but it's still going on. My consultant was a really nice guy. He showed me my scans. It was great. And he said to me, he said, I really feel like I'm taking the rug from under your feet. But, you know, he wasn't. I appreciated that he was being friendly. I appreciated that he was being empathetic. But he wasn't, certainly wasn't listening to me. He wasn't on my page. My mum had, that's my first five minute warning. My mum had, um, had breast cancer. That's my phenomenal, I don't know if I can stop it now. There. My mum had had breast cancer. My granny had had breast cancer. Granny got to 74, mum was still living healthily. Breast cancer wasn't a surprise to me. Breast cancer was a surprise to me at 45. My, parents, my, my grandparents had been 50 and my mum had been 53. But um, it wasn't a surprise and I wasn't devastated by that news. What was that I found much more challenging was actually the fact that I lost my role and I hadn't anticipated that. So the next day I told my colleagues that I was, had cancer and actually had to cocoon because I was going for an operation two weeks later. And suddenly I'd lost my role. And because we were in the middle of the COVID and actually the service still had to run, people had to be practiced, so the practical. So this is the following day. This is just checking had I changed my email, had I handed over my work stuff, and actually a couple of days later I had to empty my office. But you can still see, I'm still trying to be me. I'm still trying to be the doctor. I'm not wanting to be that patient. I'm not wanting to be the person who's labelled as an invalid. But there's my desk cleared two, two, two days later, and there's my scrubs washed and being ready to put in a box until I'm able to work again. The other thing that was really important to me was my sport. And I didn't really realise how much being a doctor and being sporty was what I identified with and what made me feel proud of being me. And so I looked for inspiration to see who had had cancer and who had kept being sporty during their treatment part of being cancer. And in fairness, I just want to say this at the outset, my cancer has been treated and it, and it was a very treatable cancer. But Navratilova, she played ten, in a tennis tournament while getting radiotherapy for breast cancer. And this British champion boxer, she continued to box while she had her treatment for breast cancer. So they were really reassuring. But like any internet search, Jana Novotna died some years later of breast cancer. So this, the, you know... A little bit of both when you search the internet. But they really inspired me and I kept active. This is the night before my operation. I was contemplating what am I going to look like when I've had this operation? What do I feel like? Well, in the photo you can tell I just felt tired. Also, I, I, I happened to reflect and think, you know what, I don't give that much monkeys about how my body looks. I don't think breasts are that nice. Clothes look much better on humans than off humans. And, and that was kind of helpful at that moment. This is me after I've had my operation. I'm just waking up. What can I learn from this photo? Well, the first thing is that patients lie. I was desperate to get out of that hospital. I had two cups of tea to prove that I wasn't nauseated, even though I was nauseated. I couldn't open the bag. I'd got a completely numb arm, and I knew not to use it. I managed just about to open the bag with my hand, and I didn't use my teeth, because I just remembered I couldn't do that. That would give away the fact I couldn't use my arm to the nurses, and I hot-footed it out of there. The uh, surgeon that came round, he said uh, he thought he'd taken away a lot of my breast. He thought he'd got everything. God willing. That's just one of those phrases that fits, that slips out. I think we need to be a bit careful about those phrases that slip out. I thought, God willing, I don't want any uncertainty in this. I hope you've got the whole lot. <laughs> Life continues, and that's a good thing, really. This is the evening after I've had my surgery. It was my dad's birthday the next day. We were making all those Zoom posters and pictures, and this, I had the note for dad. Lots of support f flew in from Shetland and from my colleagues, and it was really helpful. And that's where that being open and honest really, really was beneficial. And also where it feeds back. I think it's so helpful just to maybe do nice things for others when they are unwell. I had my, my family online, and my family were really supportive to me. I also really enjoyed going for walks and nurture in, nat in nature, and that was really uh, helped me. Mainly I walked with my dogs. Occasionally my partner was with me. But really what this slide reflects is that you have to, when we're looking at people who've got an illness, it's really important to take in, into account their, their partners. Deirdre said she was alone in hers, but actually what an illness means to you may be different to what it means to your partner. So when you have breast cancer, there's tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is a treatment for breast cancer that, that, that hits, hits your androgens. Now, that affects fertility. That might be okay for me, but it might not be okay for the partner. It might be things that we both have to deal with differently. Me, I was viciously independent. I did not want looking after. But what did my partner think? Did he want to look after me? Did he see himself as a carer? Did that change our role, our relationship? Um, 
And also the cancer word, I've already said it, didn't really frighten me that much because of my experience, but what did it mean to Tom? So when we're talking to people and when they get illnesses, we need to think really very much about their partners. This is about communication. So my um, surgeon, he said, rang me up at about two weeks and said, listen, we've got your histology back. Um, it's DCIS. I'll ring you if there's any change. You've got about 10% left to do, um, and that's fine. So some weeks later, I got a, a phone call from the radiation oncologist to arrange radiology. And uh, he was talking away. And then in the middle of it, he dropped, oh, yes, of course, you've got an um, invasive tumour with some grade one in among it. Well, nobody had told me that. That was news. What size was it? What did it mean? I had no idea. You can see these are the notes I'm taking, and I've just written it in the corner. And I came off the phone none the wiser. Bit of Googling, bit of wondering. And uh, thankfully, I had an oncology appointment soon after to find out. Really important, isn't it, that we actually take time to... Um, to keep track of what we're communicating with our patients. When I went to my oncology appointment, there was two interesting factors. They gave me my histology, which was good. Um, I, I, it's something I'd always do. On the other hand, how we need to think carefully about how we give information to patients. Because the histology was slightly disturbing. They didn't seem to know which margin was the right margin. They'd asked not the consultant about which margin should be inked, but another one. It left me with questions. Nobody really talked to me about this. Was this a problem? Now, it did give me empower me. I could have gone back and asked them to relook at that. I didn't. But, you know, if I hadn't been a doctor, or it's just an interesting thing. We have to think about how we give information. Also, I was asked, this is the first time tamoxifen was broached. Did you know you can't have sex when you start taking tamoxifen until you've got an, uh, some kind of device to prevent you getting pregnant? I didn't. Did I want to take tamoxifen? Well, the doctors definitely didn't wanted me to take tamoxifen, and they said it only had small side effects, small side effects like hot flushes and probably, possibly tipping you into menopause. Guess what? I didn't think they were such small side effects. And because nobody asked me what I thought about it, they just told me. I really wasn't engaging with the process. They, uh, I actually was wondering about metabolism. Sport's so important to me. What about menopause and muscles and sporting? And so, actually, I didn't engage very much with the tamoxifen narrative because it wasn't engaging where my questions were because the doctors weren't asking me what I felt about it. Now, they were really good doctors and really nice people, but actually, we need to be talking to our patients. I'm suggesting this medicine. You don't seem that keen. What are your reasons? This um, slide speaks to... Um, I think I've got three minutes, haven't I? This slide speaks to what does upset you and what doesn't upset you. So I was OK about the diagnosis. But this was when I was a couple of seconds after I'd sent an email to say I was giving up my PhD for the year, only for the year. But again, I think it was something that meant something to me. It was my identity. It was what I was able to do. And that really distressed me. And I think what I'm talking about here is saying when people are, uh, have an illness, maybe ask them, how are you going? Is there anything bothering you? And you may find it's quite different to what you expect more card sustained me and actually I had quite a nice time during Covid because um, I was doing lots of walks and I think my partner was quite surprised when I told somebody I had a quite nice time during Covid. Uh, he thought it'd been terrible because I'd had cancer. I did a lot of driving down to Colway to get radiotherapy and this is when I uh, was first going into radiotherapy. One of the things I learned was it's that people in PPE can still be nice if their words actually count for a lot. Um, there's a whole other story about, uh, about patient advocacy, and maybe I will tell this story, but it happened to me twice. When I was, um, when I was getting, uh, what's the word, when you're planning radiotherapy, they initially planned that I would have it at the public hospital, but then they realised my heart was in the zone where you get radiotherapy and I could potentially get heart failure. So they sent me to the... Um, the hospital, the private hospital, where you have this fantastic talk about in innovative stuff. You breathe in, you lift up your heart, therefore your heart is no longer in the radiotherapy zone and it's much better for you. So they planned my radiotherapy there, but then they rang me maybe a week later. We're really sorry, Anna, your insurance doesn't cover the public hospital, I mean the private hospital, so we're going to put you back to the public hospital and uh, we're just going to see what happens. I was like, you what? I said, you're going to tell me how much it costs and I'm going to tell you whether I can afford it. But if I hadn't been a patient, I hadn't been a doctor, and actually if I couldn't afford it, what would have happened? I raised it with my radiation oncologist and he said, well, I think I might have picked it up and I think I'd have found you somewhere else, but it wasn't certain. Similarly, when I had a gene test, and we won't get there because I haven't got enough time, but when I had a gene test, I got sent a, uh, in fact, I'll skip through to it because I probably can't do the rest. Look, I did running, I saw some nice nature, I was upset about other stuff. Uh, this is me half an hour after being upset. That's just that bit. You don't know what somebody's been going through on the day. I was upset because I've been reading stats. 
Um, this is me when I went back to work, and this is when I got the test for the, my genes. With this gene test, I was sent a letter a year after I'd been referred for the gene test, and it said, do you still really want to be on this gene list a year later? Well, as a doctor, I thought, yes, my mum had cancer, my granny had cancer, I know they're above 50, but it seems a bit strange that I've got cancer. So I wrote back and said, yes, but what if I hadn't been a doctor? What if I hadn't been someone who was proactive? What if I hadn't had advantages? And so I got the gene test. This is back in my room again, because it's really hard to find time to do these things and get DHL to pick up your test. Um, so I got my test, and um, actually it turned out I did have a gene for cancer. I don't have the BRAC gene, but I have a gene that means that I'm 30% more likely to have cancer in the future. Interesting, isn't it? Because I thought about getting a gene test, and I thought, that's great, my family can screen themselves and make decisions about their health. I thought, it might tell me about why I got cancer. What I didn't think is, it might mean I'm more at risk in the future. And that was just something I, I hadn't even contemplated me. Contemplated. And this is me walking back from seeing patients on the day I was told that I had got the gene for cancer. I'm not really sad there. I'm bemused. What on earth do you do with that information? What on earth does it mean? And I still don't really know. It's just there. It's, it's in the ether. It doesn't bother me so much now. It bothered me a bit then. This was when I was cleaning my teeth the following day, or a couple of days later. I looked in the mirror and I thought, wow, I might never get jowls but not for a good reason. Um, and similarly, actually, just in terms of body image, you know, I think sometimes I'm like, oh, I've got a scar, I'm like a warrior, I've survived. But there was another day when I was cleaning my teeth and for some reason that I hadn't the dressing gown on, no idea why, and I found myself cleaning my teeth like this. And you know why? Because I felt that side of my body was ugly. And I hadn't really realized that I, real, that I, I do have a perception that it's a more ugly side of my body. So it's just interesting. It's a process and it changes on day to day. So we really need to listen to our patients and, and, and listen to our patients and listen to our friends and just be ready to check in with them as individuals because for everybody it's a different journey and this is the things that meant something to me and, and that affected my life and, and we need to think about how, how we communicate with patients so those are the sort of take home messages that I can give you in 15 minutes so thank you very much Anna, thank you for sharing such a personal journey with us. Um, I'm just wondering, because you're a doctor, do you think other doctors treated you differently with interactions? I don't know. I mean, one of the doctors didn't know I was a doctor, so there was a wee fib fell into his lies. You know, he said, I mean, into his rhetoric. He said, uh, I'm going to treat you, treat you at the public hospital because it's safer than going to the private hospital. And I was like, it was for radiotherapy. I was like, come on now, what's going to happen to me when I have my radiotherapy, you know? I think if I'd been a doctor, he probably wouldn't have put that line in. Um, but I don't know. I don't know whether they told me when I was lying on the bed like that because I was a doctor and they thought I could cope with it. Um, so I, I'm really not quite sure. Um, Does anybody have any questions for Anna? I'm thinking I should have asked, do you want questions? But it's too late now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure, we move on to our final speaker of the day. <laughs> 